We're going to be done with Genesis before we know it. Uh, but we're really getting into the last uh, bit of Genesis when we're dealing with Joseph. And so uh, those that have read through Genesis, you know, you know that uh, the story of Joseph really goes pretty much to the end of the book. Um, but, but we're going to get into a lot more about Joseph. And so um, <clears throat> this is where it starts with the story of Joseph. And really with, with Joseph... What, what I'm going to be uh, talk, I'm going to be talking about different things in this chapter, but what I'm going to really be focusing on is more so how Joseph parallels with Jesus and the, the allegories that are going on in this chapter. So you could really go in this chapter and preach on a lot of different things, um, but I just kind of want to show those pictures that we see uh, with Joseph, kind of like what we saw with Isaac and Abraham and all those pictures that we saw in, in Genesis chapter 22. And so I probably won't hit all of them. I'll probably, there's probably some that I don't even have in my notes that, that's in here. You may look at it later and be like, hey, what about that? You know, so um, this is one of those chapters that is really kind of thick in there as far as uh, the picture of Christ. And so that's one thing with Genesis, though. There's a lot of pictures of Christ in Genesis. And that's one reason I love the book of Genesis. Um, but, but anyway, so starting there in verse 1, it says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger and in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, one thing I want you to just see here is that how old is Joseph? Joseph's 17 years old. And uh, spoiler alert, he's going to, you know, go through a lot of trouble. And by the time he gets to the point where he's actually in Egypt and he gets delivered out of prison and all that, he's going to be 30 years old. So this gives you the timeline as far as how long that took from him being sold in this chapter to when he actually became the second in Egypt as far as authority. So 13 years of, of just, you know, tribulation and persecution. But... And it also, you know, a lot of times, too, you want to see, too, like, what does it mean when someone says the lad? You know, what's that mean? Or, like, are, are you dealing with, like, a little child? Um, well, we know that a lad can be at least 17. And Ishmael was around this age, too, when it talks about the lad. You know, and the fact that Ishmael would have been 14 years old when Isaac was born. And when Isaac was weaned is when he was cast out. And so let's say he was weaned at two years old. That means he's around 16. And so if you remember, she put the, she lifted up, you know, she, she had, took the lad with her. And so it kind of gives you an idea of what a, how old a lad is. Uh, same thing with a, uh, a maid and all that other stuff as far as the age goes. So this gives you a good little marker as far as that goes, but it tells us exactly how old he is. But also we see here a little bit about Joseph. It says here that he was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. So those are the two handmaidens, right? Remember, Bilhah was Rachel's handmaiden, and uh, Zilpah was Leah's, and they both had two sons. If you remember, uh, Dan and Naphtali and Gad and Asher. And so those sons are who she, he was with. And it says, Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Okay? Now, it doesn't say that this is a right thing that he did. Actually, the Bible, a lot of times in Proverbs, which we're not going to go there tonight, um, but it talks about um, tail bearers and tattlers, and it's not a good thing, okay? Now, obviously, that, that's what I, I don't want our church to be something where it's like, hey, did you know what so-and-so did? You know, I saw so-and-so over at, at the movie theater or something like You know what I mean? Like, don't tell me that. Like, I don't want to know, okay? I want to I think that everybody's just, you know, praising God and not doing anything wrong, okay? So... That's what I see as a tattler, okay? It's where you're like, hey, so-and-so watched a movie the other night, or so-and-so did this, or so-and-so did that. It's like, no, just, I, I'd rather not know, okay? <laughs> but if it comes to, like, it's something serious, like if you got the list in 1 Corinthians where someone's an extortioner, covetous, or they're, uh, you know, a fornicator, obviously those are things that need to be brought to my attention. Obviously someone's a sodomite or a reprobate. Obviously those things are, those are that's different. But when you're dealing with just someone, let's say they were doing something they shouldn't be doing, or, uh, you know, it, but it has, it's not something that grievous to where it's a church item that needs to be brought to my attention, just don't tell me about it, okay? I don't want to know. And if, you, if, if someone comes up to me and they're like, so-and-so, 
you know, went and did this, you know, or they did this and they're trying to get them in trouble. I don't like that, okay? I'm just gonna be upfront with you. I, I'm gonna be more angry at you for trying to get them in trouble than what they did, okay? And so I personally think that this is something, as far as Joseph, it's not something that he should be doing. I think that, uh, you know, that's one of the big reasons why they didn't like him, okay? You think about it, have, everybody's got their siblings, okay? I, you know, I had two siblings, and or I have two siblings, and the younger one, you know, will tattle on you and say something, and and you just want to beat him into the ground, right? You know, that's how you feel about it, okay? I, don't, I didn't ever cast him into a pit and try to slay him, but you can see that sl- sibling, like, uh, disdain for each other because of that. And so that's how it starts off, and that's interesting that it just says that right off the bat, that he gave an evil report. But we also see in verse 3 there, there is a fault, I think, with Israel, with Jacob, and how he treated his sons. And this fault caused this issue. Now, you can't, you can't take the fault of Israel and excuse what they did, okay? That doesn't excuse it. But you can see how it led into it. You can see how that was the downfall of why, they're, why they didn't like Joseph and all this other stuff. And so in, in verse 3 there, it says, now, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So the Bible is stating why he loved Joseph. It wasn't that Joseph was like a real, okay, maybe he was a good kid, okay, to a certain extent. I think they were all probably decent sons. But, but the Bible stating why he loved him more is because he was his son in his old age. It's because he was Rachel's son. That's what it comes down to. He loved Rachel more than Leah, and therefore he loved Joseph more than the rest of his sons because he was born of Joseph. And that's why later on he's, he's really hesitant to, get, to have Benjamin go with him because it's Rachel's other son. It's the only son that he has left of Rachel. And so uh, we see why, you know, what, what the problem is here. He's loving him based, not based off him being, a, a, you know, a, a more righteous son. And this is something that we need to think about with our children is that we, you know, they're going to have a child that's an easier child. You're going to have a child that's, that's going to be a little more obedient. You can't tell the difference between mine. They're both bad. Okay. <laughs> but no. but the, the thing is, is that you're going to have ones that are sweeter than others and ones that are more difficult than others. Okay. And so you don't love the one that's easier and sweeter more than the other one. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have consequences, you mean, meaning this, like your one child's bad and you have to spank them more, right? That doesn't mean that you don't spank them more because they're doing stuff more often wrong. But what that means is that you still love them the same because spanking them means you love them. Disciplining them means you love them. And so we need to love our children equally. That's what I believe. And I believe Jacob made a mistake here on how he was openly loving Joseph more than the rest of his children. And it was, it was prevalent. It was obvious. Obvious to where they saw it. Okay? So they didn't necessarily, it doesn't say that they, they, they hated him because he told on them. Although I think that fueled the fire. Okay? So you can imagine he's the favorite. He's the baby. And he gets everything. He gets this coat of many colors, all this stuff. And he's the youngest. And, you know, obviously Joseph is the youngest. Or, I mean, uh, Benjamin's the youngest. But he's being spoiled here. And so, uh, getting that special treatment, that's what caused all this envy. And so they envied him because of that, and that's where this, all this stuff, when he brings up these dreams, now he's bringing up, you know, we get into the dreams that he has, and the, the dream's clear that he's stating that all his brethren are going to bow down before him. Okay? So this is festering. <laughs> okay? Imagine how this starts. You have the fact that, okay, you know, he goes back and tattles on them you know, of what they're doing, you know, or whatever, right? But then, you know, he gets this coat of many colors. It's, pr- it's obvious that, that Jacob is giving him a lot more attention and treating him better than them. And then, then Joseph comes and has these dreams and says, oh, by the way, everybody's going to bow down to me. So you can imagine how that would make them feel, okay? That doesn't justify what they did, 
But you can see how this builds up to where it's not like out of the ordinary that you'd think they'd be angry at him. Okay. But let's go into the dreams that he has, okay? Because if you know the, if you know Joseph, that's one of the big things to know about Joseph is that he's an interpreter of dreams, or that he he's he's kind of you know um, what I have the title as Joseph the dreamer. Okay, so he has these dreams that obviously God is giving to him. Okay, and so uh, nothing bad about this, but he's he's showing him this. What's interesting though is that he doesn't see. It's kind of like when you see the mountain, but you don't see the valley before it. You see the mountain which the dream is, is that all his brethren are going to bow down to him. And then, but you don't see the valley of the 13 years that he has to go through all this hardship to get to that. Okay? And so sometimes we need to realize that as, as far as we see that mountain, we see that, that uh, mark we're trying to get, but a lot of times we don't see the valley that we have to go through to get to that point. And so, or God won't even like, he'll maybe show you, hey, here's where you need to be but you don't see what you have to go through to get to that, okay? But in verse 5 there, there's two dreams that he has, and I believe both the dreams are talking about the same thing, okay? So in verse 5 there, it says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And you'll see why, okay? So it's, it, he's going to explain the dream that he told them. And verse 6 it says, And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come, down, come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So there's two dreams here. We have the one dream where... You have these sheaves that are bowing down to his sheaf. And then you have the sun, moon, and stars, the 11 stars that are bowing down to him. So it's both the same type of dream. It's just different ways of showing it. But what this shows me is that this dream was established by God because it was twice. Now, this is going to happen later when he uh, interprets the dream for Pharaoh. Go to, go to uh, Genesis 41 and what, what Joseph's going to state later, we'll see back here, would apply as well. Because if you remember, we'll, we'll get into that eventually when we get to that chapter as far as that Pharaoh has this dream about the kine, but then also the corn, right? And, and the, the same, it was, it was a different dream, but it was the same thing that was happening um, dealing with the seven years of famine, seven years of plenty. And so, but in verse 32, I just want you to see this. It says, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. So why was this doubled? Because it's established by God, because it was going to happen. Okay? And so it's interesting, that's how the story starts with Joseph, and that's kind of how it ends with Joseph, as far as how he, uh, he got set up as the second in command in, in, in Egypt. Um, obviously, there's more to the story after that, and with his brethren and his father coming in and all that stuff. But, but pretty much, he he had got his position of power at that point. And so, uh, with this dream, though, uh, it, it said twice, but said it in a different way. But I wanted to address the sun, moon, and stars, and and go to Revelation chapter 12, um, because people take this passage here, and in Revelation chapter 12, they try to say. They try to state that, these, that the people in Revelation 12 are the nation of Israel. Okay? And that's where they get into this, this, the end times that you know, the nation of Israel is who uh, the Antichrist is persecuting and, and all this other stuff. And so I just wanted to address that because they kind of come back to this passage with the sun, moon, and stars dealing with you know, the, the, the children of Israel and all that stuff. So, um, but I just want to talk about that for a second. And 
I do think there is a, an application in how that, that parallels a little bit, but not to the extent they're saying, okay? So in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, we're going to read the first five verses here just so you can kind of see what's going on. It says in verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared a, another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So I'm going to just tell you what they say. What they say is that this woman is Israel, the nation of Israel. Now, first of all, it doesn't make sense because Israel's a man. You say, well, you know, Israel, you know, sometimes the nation of Israel is referred to as a woman. Where? Jerusalem's referred to as a woman, but the nation of Israel is always referred to as a man. So a lot of times what you'll see is cities are referred to as women, like it kind of ha it has a feminine pronoun but the nation itself has a, a, a male pronoun, right? And so uh, I don't see that. I don't see where Israel would be a woman, first of all. But it also, here, here's the thing. Israel, in this passage of Genesis chapter 37, is the sun, right? If you're going to look at this passage as far as what these things represent, the sun would be who? It would be Jacob. And the moon would be who? The mother, his wife. And then the stars would be the children, and that obviously you can see that parallel. You can see how that works with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and how the woman is the glory of the man. You can see the sun and then how the moon is the glory of the sun. And so there's, a, there's definitely a big relationship there with the sun and the moon, the, the greater light and the weaker light, the weaker vessel. All that stuff works together. But here's the thing. It doesn't say that the stars brought forth a child because if you're going to say anybody's Israel, it would be the 12 stars. Right? Or the sun. You'd say the man Israel is the sun, and then the stars are the nation of Israel. But we're talking about the woman. The woman, here's the thing, the woman isn't the sun, moon, or the stars in this passage. She's clothed with the sun, and the, the moon is at her feet, or under, her, or under her feet, and she has a crown of 12 stars. Now what this passage is really saying, and for sake of time I'm going through the whole story of, of Revelation chapter 12, the woman and the serpent goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and the seed, right? I'll put enmity between her seed and thy seed. And as you see in this passage, you're dealing with the serpent and the woman going at it with each other. But then it's, it's the Antichrist, which would be the seed of Satan, against the seed of the woman, which is those that keep the commandments of God, those that are saved, right? And so what's going on here is the woman represents all living, right? It's, it's dealing with... Eve is who? If the woman in the Garden of Eden would be Eve, right? Why was she named Eve? Because she's the mother of all living. So that's why in that chapter you're dealing with the persecution of the whole world. The first four seals are to the whole world. Famine, pestilence, and then the fourth part of the world is killed. But it's not until the abomination of desolation that it's going strictly after the saved. Okay, so you see that switch. But what this, why, well, why is it talking about the sun, moon, and the, the 12 stars? Obviously the 12 stars would represent... Israel, okay, as far as, but what this is stating is that, what, what's, the whole, what's the whole point of this? It's the fact that she's bringing forth a, son, a child, a son, which is obviously Jesus, okay? So Jesus is being brought forth here, and it even talks about how the dragon was ready to, to, to devour the child, and it says uh, in verse 4 there, which was ready to be delivered, to, for to devour her child as soon as it was born, which obviously it, it was, happened with Herod when, when Herod was trying to kill Jesus, and he had to flee, they had to flee into Egypt. Okay? And then uh, when it says that he br she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, that's obviously talking about Jesus. Uh, and then it says her child was caught up unto God and to his throne because he's sitting at the right hand of God. Okay? So we're obviously talking about Jesus. <coughs> and, and the reason it, it talks about the sun, moon, and the 12 stars around, on a crown of 12 stars, is because Mary was obviously someone that was born of Eve. I mean, it would come down of Eve and of the woman. She's a, a living person. 
but she was of the nation of Israel. And it's proving that Jesus came out of the tribe of Israel. And specifically, if you go to Revelation chapter 5, of the line of the tribe of Judah. And so in Revelation 5, 5, it says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So all this is stating here in Revelation 12 is the fact that Jesus was born in that lineage. And we see that in Matthew 1, we see that in Luke chapter 3, that that proves that Jesus' lineage comes all the way back to Judah, to Israel, to Abraham, right? And even going into David, you know, being more specific with David, right? And, and Jesus says in Revelation 22 and verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He's the root of David because he created David. But he's also the, the, he's, he's the offspring of David because he was born of the Virgin Mary. So he, he's God who created everything, but he also became a man. And so uh, that's all that's saying. But I just wanted to address that because they always go back to that that passage in Genesis 37. And I do think there is kind of a, a, a foreshadowing a little bit, but it, you know, the 12 stars, I would say, represents the 12 tribes of Israel, but it's just showing, it's honing it down, right? You think the woman, that's mother of all living, but in particular, in the story of who's giving birth is someone that's of Israel. Jesus came of Israel. He's of the tribe of Judah. He was of the seed of David. That's something that's mentioned over and over and over again in the New Testament. And so that's all that's saying there. And so uh, going back to Genesis chapter 37, Genesis chapter 37. But people always go into that type of weird stuff, okay, when it comes to like pulling in the Jews or pulling in all this other stuff. They got to go into some cryptic. I mean, Revelation 12 is not exactly the most clear passage when you're dealing with end times prophecy, okay? Because, it, it, I mean, you're dealing with these visions of a, of a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And it's, it's pretty cryptic. I mean, a woman that's clothed in the sun. This is obviously uh, symbolistic, right? You're not actually wearing the sun, you know. You know, the woman didn't take the sun, rip it apart, and put it on like a jacket, okay? It just means that when, if sun's shining upon you, right, you're clothed with it. Right? And so it's a figure of speech that you'd be clothed with the sun because it's... It's, you're shining because of the sun. So, anyway, so Genesis chapter 37, verse 12, getting into the fact of what they do with Joseph here. So he dreams this dream. They're not happy about it, obviously. And he goes to find his brethren, and they conspire to kill him. And then they're going to throw him into a pit, and then they're going to sell him off, okay? So a horrible thing that happens to him here. But, but let's look at this passage, verse 12 there. It says, And his brethren went to feed their, their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, <clears throat> Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And and so, first of all, I want you to see here in verse four, up to 14 here, you can see the parallel of the father sending the son to his brethren. Remember this, that Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. He was betrayed by his own brethren. Right? And it says that uh, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So we know that there, there's a lot to be said about that. He came unto Israel, and his whole ministry was to Israel, and they rejected him. And so you can definitely see the parallel here as far as Isaac would be like God the Father, and, and Joseph would be like God the Son going out to see how his brethren are doing, right? And so in verse 15 it says, And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dotham. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dotham. <clears throat> so notice in verse 18, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. 
And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands, to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out, uh, out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, there was no, no water in it. So there's a lot of parallels here dealing with, with Jesus and Joseph. Um, but the one thing you see here is Reuben is really the one that delivered him from being killed from his brethren. And so Reuben, the, the one good thing said about Reuben here, <laughs> really, honestly, is in this passage because he, he went up to his father's couch and we'll see later when he's going to bring that up again. He loses his birthright because of that. He's unstable as water. <laughs> okay, But this is the one case where Reuben really kind of steps in but, but not completely, okay, because uh, they end up selling him when Reuben's not there. So Reuben kind of left off his guard of Joseph. But in this case, he does deliver them out of their hands to where they don't kill him and throw him into the pit. They just throw him into the pit. And so what he's basically saying to him, let's, let's throw him into the pit and we'll be done with him. So he doesn't, he's, he's basically telling his brethren, you know, he's going to be out of a hair. But in his mind, he's saying, I'm going to come back and get him so I can take him back to my father, you know, take him back safely. And so he's kind of trying to, you know, I, I'm on your side. You know, he's kind of like, I'm on your side, brethren. But in his mind, he's like, I'm going to deliver him. I'm going to take him back to, to Jacob. And uh, obviously he doesn't get a chance when he comes back. You know, that's what happens later. But they conspired against him to slay him. This is something that happened to Jesus constantly, right? The Pharisees were constantly conspiring and trying to catch him in his words, trying to get a reason to kill him. And that's constantly through the New Testament, through the Gospels is what you see of the Pharisees and where he's coming unto his own and his own received him not, and they're conspiring to kill him. And, <clears throat> and so in this case, though, they strip Joseph of his coat. You can definitely see how that applies. And we're not going to go to all the scriptures on this, but they stripped Jesus of his garments they scourged him, they put a robe upon him, and they plaited a crown of thorns, and they mocked him, and smote upon him, and spit upon him. And so you can definitely see the shame, right? He has this coat of many colors, and they just rip it off of him, and throw him into this pit. But the pit is what I want you to see here, because I definitely think that this is a parallel. The pit, notice it says that in verse 24, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. Now, believe it or not, we're going to be in Zechariah for a little bit here. You're like, good night. Well, this is going to be a simple sermon. We're going to Zechariah. If there was a book that was a cryptic book, it's Zechariah. <laughs> okay? But go to Zechariah chapter 9. Because this phrase, or this, this uh, talking about a pit where, wherein is no water, is brought up in Zechariah. So, you say, well, what is this picture? I believe it pictures hell. It pictures hell, uh, a pit with no water. Constantly, especially in the Old Testament, you see hell described as a pit. But even in the New Testament, what is it called? The bottomless pit. So in the New Testament, it gives you a little more information about it. Why is it bottomless? Because we're, we're, we have a globe, okay? We're, and so in the center of the earth, you wouldn't have that. It basically, be there, there would be no bottom, right? Because as soon as you got to the middle, now down is up. So there's no bottom. That's why it's the bottomless pit. But, but this pit that has no water. Why? Because it's a big ball of fire. That's why. And so uh, in Luke chapter 16, we see that, he, that, uh, that the rich man just wanted uh, uh, him to dip his finger in water and give it to him. So that should tell you that there's no water down in hell. If he just wants just a little bit. That'd be like, he's not just saying a drip of water. He's just saying, put your finger in water and put your finger on my tongue. Just a little amount of water that would even stick on your finger. That's how much he wanted. So there's no water in hell. You know, I've heard people preach about like no tears in hell. 
you know, because it would be like physically impossible to have tears with all the heat and the fire and all that stuff. This isn't a sermon on hell, but I just want you to see that this is an aspect of hell uh, as far as no, there's no water. Uh, but in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, just backing up there because we're going to see this is clearly talking about Jesus or a prophecy of Jesus. This is where this prophecy that's brought up in the New Testament is at. It says in verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So this is clearly the scripture about Jesus coming and riding on the, the, the colt where he comes into Jerusalem. They're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, right? But in verse 10, it says, Now I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. And so uh, this is a reference, I believe, to hell. But it's, it's the fact that we're being saved from hell. Now people will take this passage and they'll say, well, you know, that means they were in there. You know, Old Testament saints were down in hell, and then they were saved out of it, and the prisoners, he led captivity captive and all that stuff. Now, first of all, we, I, I don't have time to show you this, but prisoners in the Bible, when it talks about it, it's just talking about people that aren't saved. We're in bondage to the corruptions of this world, and when he's talking about preaching the gospel to the prisoners, he was preaching the people that were there in his ministry in living. They were living and breathing people, but they were prisoners to what? Sin. They were, they were, they were bound. Uh, by sin, and they were cursed by law and destined for hell. But I, even in the same passage, or in the same book, we'll give you uh, a passage that will show you that when it says that, when it says that he, he sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit, it's, it's basically stating like, I saved you out of the fire before you went into it. Okay? And this is actually something that's, that's brought up, and even in Jude we'll see, okay? and how it phrases that. Okay, so don't get uh, bent out of shape when you see that, where it says he sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. It's not saying that they were there. He's basically saying, I saved you from that. Okay? Then Zechariah chapter 3. So go back a few chapters. And again, if you're going to get your doctrine as far as where people went, you know, Old Testament saints and all this other stuff went, Zechariah is not the book to go to. Okay? I mean, if you want clear passages on salvation and heaven and hell, Zechariah is a very cryptic book. I'd, I'd like to find someone that would come up to me and say, no, Zechariah is a very clear book. I mean, it's like John. Okay, no. Zechariah is a very cryptic book. And one that I'm probably not going to preach through, like, chapter by chapter for a little while. <laughs> okay, because I want to make sure I'm seasoned as a pastor and, and just want to make sure I teach it right. Um, but I'll say this, Pastor Anderson preached through the book of Zechariah, and it was fantastic. Okay. Um, it was one of those books I'm like, man, that, that was a good, I mean, you just tell, like, you know, he, he knows his stuff, and um, when he was going through it, I'm like, oh, it makes sense, and, like, there's different passages that are really tough, um, but I don't want to just wing that one, okay? I'm not just going to go into that one and just be like, all right, let's see what happens. Uh, no, I want to make sure I know what I'm, what I'm talking about when I go into it. But in Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1 there, dealing with Joshua, the high priest here, it says in verse 1, it says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So he's, he's asking a question there, but notice it's plucked out of the fire. Now did Jerusalem go to hell and come back? Or is he stating a fact that he saved them from that fire? or he saved Joshua from that fire. So keep reading there in verse 3. It says, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And so everybody knows, you know, when you look in Revelation, that what, what's the change of raiment? The white linen, which is the righteousness of saints. And so... Uh, the garment, talking about the flesh. Go to Jude. Jude, and we use this for soul winning all the time. 
So what do we see in Zechariah dealing with Joshua and dealing with Jerusalem? He's saying that this is a brand plucked out of the fire. Okay? It's not saying that Jerusalem was in hell and then they brought him out of hell. No, it's basically saying it's been saved from hell. It's been saved from the fire. In verse 22 of Jude, it says, And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear. Notice this. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So when we win people to Christ, are we literally pulling them out of hell? Like they're in hell and then we pull them out? No. When we save them, we're pulling them out of the fire because they're condemned already. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Because if, you, if you're not saved, if, you, if you're not believing on Christ, it, it's destined. I mean, it's as if you're, getting, you're in the fire already. It's just when you get saved, you're being pulled out of it. Okay? And so don't get, get caught up with that when it talks about, you know, that he, he sent forth the prisoners out of the pit. You know, I mean, even in the same book, it talks about a, a brand that was plucked out of the fire. And then we are saving those with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Okay, and so it's just a phrase, it's just a way to express that that's what they're being saved from. By what? The blood of his covenant. So, there's an Old Testament picture of what it takes to be saved. It's by his blood. It's always been by his blood. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And his blood was, was there before the foundation of the world, but he was before ordained, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So, I just wanted you to see that, that pit with no water. You can see, obviously, if Joseph is representing, is kind of being an allegorical picture of Jesus, his father sent him to see how his brethren were doing. His brethren conspired to kill him, and they threw him into a pit after they stripped him from all his garments. If you can't see Jesus coming unto his own, and his own received him not, he was stripped of his garments, he was crucified, and then his body was put into a tomb, and his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption, I don't know what to tell you, because that is obviously a picture of the fact that he went into the pit, wherein is no water, but he didn't stay there. So in this passage, as far as, uh, you know, what we see with um, how Jacob responds to this, it's the death. It's the death of his son. Okay, now we know that he didn't really die in this passage, just as much as Isaac didn't really die, although it pictured the death, burial, and resurrection, right? So, but Joseph didn't die, but he kind of did. You know, if you think about it, you know, he, he died and then he's, he's, he's resurrected in the fact that he's, you know, brought up to the second command. Isn't that the way it is with Jesus and the Father? You know, so there's a lot of pictures, and I, obviously I'm not going to get to all of them, and there's probably some I'm going to miss, <laughs> okay? But do you see, the Joseph story, there's a lot of uh, parallels, okay? So I just want you to see some of those and just see how, the, how brilliant the Bible is and how the story of Jesus is the greatest story that's ever told. I mean, I know I preached on that one time, you know, and, but it's very, it's true. I mean, throughout, and when Jesus was talking to his disciples after he rose from the dead and said, and he expounded on the scriptures on how all the prophets bear witness of him, I mean, just in Genesis alone, how many pictures have we seen of Jesus? And this is throughout the rest of the Bible that's going to be like that. But going back to Genesis chapter 37, there's another picture that you're going to see here. So, as Reuben is off, and, he, and obviously he's not there because when he comes back, Joseph's gone, his brethren conspire to sell him. So they're going to sell him off to these Midianites, and ultimately he ends up in Egypt. Verse 25, it says, And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead, and their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it? If we slay our brother and conceal his blood, come and let us sell him to the Ish Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Then there passed by, by Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. So you can probably imagine what I'm going to parallel this with, okay? 20 pieces of silver, 30 pieces of silver that they sold, that Judas sold 
you know, and betray Jesus for. Go to Zechariah chapter 11. You're like, good night, we're spending time in Zechariah. Yeah, but there's a lot of prophecies about Jesus in Zechariah. And so there's a lot of cryptic stuff, but then there's a lot of stuff that's very clear because the New Testament gives clarity to it. And so that's why when you can go back to Zechariah, you basically, the, the best way to, to, to understand a cryptic book is to take all the passages that you know for sure have been clarified in the New Testament and just know for sure that's what that's talking about, right? When I showed you the, the, the king coming lowly, lowly and on, upon the colt, the, the foal of an ass, there's no question of what that's talking about. It's already been done. So you can look at that and be like, case closed, this is talking about Jesus coming into Jerusalem, you know, that we know what that's talking about. And so the same thing with the, the 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah chapter 11, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, and it says, And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver, and the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was priced at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And so, uh, obviously, this is talking about Jesus being betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. By the way, in the New Testament, it says that this was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, or Jeremy the prophet, as it says in the New Testament, but it's not written in Jer Jeremiah the prophet. But that's why it's very important when it says spoken and not written. Okay, because obviously Jeremiah spoke it, but he didn't write it. That's why in Matthew chapter 2 it says, As spoken by the prophecy shall be called a Nazarene. But you can't find that in the, in the Old Testament. But it's spoken, not written. And that's why Enoch, Enoch prophesied, you know, that the Lord shall come with ten thousands of the saints, never written in the Old Testament, but he spoke it. And so that's why it's very, you know, uh, Brother Dave was talking about Old Testament salvation. It's a foolish thought to look at the Old Testament and say, this is all they knew. Because it's very clear in the New Testament there were things that they knew and things that, that were spoken that wasn't written. I mean, we have plenty of scripture showing that. Enoch's an example, Jeremiah's an example, and just different prophecies that came to pass are examples of that. Uh, but, but we see that that definitely would parallel. But, but another thought here, he goes into Egypt. Okay? What does Jesus do when he's born? When, when he's born, Herod wants to kill him. We saw that in Revelation chapter 12, that the dragon was trying to kill him. And uh, he, the, uh, the, the angel tells him to go into Egypt. And notice in Matthew, go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And so, like, like I said, I was actually, uh, I was talking to Brother Matt Stuckey because he's actually preaching on Reuben in this chapter tonight. <laughs> and uh, so we're both in the same chapter and all that stuff, but he was talking to me about Reuben and stuff. I'm like, well, I'm not really getting too much into Reuben. But so there's so many other things that you get, you get into in this chapter dealing with his brethren. I mean, Judah, for example, saves him here. So you have Reuben, the firstborn, who saves him the initially. But then it's really Judah who steps in when his brother, when, when Re Reuben's not there, and Judah steps in and says, don't kill him, let's just sell him. Okay? And, uh, and we know that Judah is the one that actually is going to have the genealogy of Jesus. So you can see definitely a parallel there as far as the line out of the tribe of Judah and how he delivered him and all that. But anyway, um, in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And when you go to the Hosea in verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, that's where that's being said. It says, As spoken by the Lord, by the prophet. Um, you know, in, in, in Hosea 11, 1, it says, When Israel was a child... Then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So you can definitely see how this would picture in the fact that he's, he's being sold into Egypt and, and how uh, you know, even Jesus had to flee into Egypt for a little bit before he came into, you know, into Nazareth and all that stuff. So um, just trying to show you some parallels here as far as what's going on with Joseph. And this is just chapter 37, <laughs> okay? Because chapter 38... Um, 
kind of like chapter 36 deals with Edom and Esau and all his, his descendants. Chapter 38 is going to be kind of like this little interlude where you're dealing with Judah and Tamar and, and that whole story. Um, but it's going to pick back up where it leaves off in this chapter in, in, verse, in chapter 39. And it's going to go straight from where he's in Egypt and what's going on with Potiphar and all that stuff. So, um, But there's just a lot more stuff to... These, these chapters will be packed. So, but, uh, but going back to Genesis chapter 37, at the end of the chapter here, and with the end of the chapter, I see, I see some parallels here dealing with Jesus being resurrected. Okay, Because notice it says in verse 29, it says, And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. So you can definitely see when, when Jesus rose from the dead, it wasn't like everybody was just happy immediately, right? They went to the tomb. They were still sorrowful. It's like they didn't believe that he rose from the dead. And they went to the tomb. They saw he wasn't there. And so there was still sorrow. There's still confusion going on as far as what was going on. It's not until later that they finally saw him. And then, you know, obviously they were rejoicing and all that. But what, what this is really showing us here is the sorrow, the sorrow of the death of Joseph. And to Reuben here, I believe Reuben really thinks he's dead. Because notice in verse 30, it says, And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? So Reuben, I think, is really thinking he's gone, he's dead. That his brothers killed him or something happened to him, right? And so he doesn't, I, I think that's just his mentality. Because uh, later on, when we're dealing with uh, Jacob, and how his brethren come back and said, we need to take J- Benjamin with us. Because Joseph is obviously kind of toying with him, <laughs> right? And, uh, and he says, you know, Joseph is not. So when it says that, remember Rachel weeping for her children because they are not. When it says that are not, is not, is the beast that, it, that was and is not, right? And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. When it says that, it means they're dead. Okay, so that's what he's stating here is that, the child is not. So he literally, he believes that Joseph's dead. And so, and he's saying, I, whither shall I go? So you can imagine, because he's the eldest. He's the eldest brother, and, and, and he allowed his, his younger brother to die. And we'll see this with Judah later on, because when Benjamin, when he's threatening to take Benjamin away from him, and he swore to his father that he'd bring him back safely. And he's going to say, you know, how can I return to my father if the lad be not with me? And so uh, you can never see kind of Reuben and Judah and how they kind of handle these situations. But notice in verse 31, it says, And they took Joseph's coat and killed a, goat, a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. So you can even see with this coat and the fact of it being dipped in blood, what, who's going to have a vesture dipped in blood? Jesus. And what does the blood represent? Obviously, it represents his blood, the blood he shed for the sins of many. Okay? And even those that killed him. Right? And so... Uh, there's definitely a parallel there with the coat, the garment dipped in blood. We'll even see that when you're dealing with Judah and, and Genesis chapter 49, when it talks about his garment that's going to be dipped in wine and in the blood of grapes, obviously going all the way to Revelation 19, dealing with the word of God, which is Jesus coming down on a white horse with a vesture dipped in blood. And so uh, there's definitely uh, a parallel there. But notice it in verse 34 there, it says, And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And, and he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. So what do we see here? We see a great mourning, you know, a bitter mourning. That's exactly the way it was with Jesus' disciples when he died. They were mourning. And, and the Bible prophesied of that happening. Go to Zechariah chapter 12. I promise the last time we're going to Zechariah that we're, we're finishing up here. Um, but 
when I was doing this, this is, when I was writing my sermon, I was like, good night. I'm like, every verse I'm going to is in Zechariah. So it just happened to be that way. Um, but But in chapter 12 and verse 10, chapter 12 and verse 10, it says this. It says, And I will pour, pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his for, firstborn. And that's what we see with Jacob is the bitterness. I mean, it's as if he lost his firstborn. And that's what, uh, obviously, we see when Jesus dies and his disciples and the women are all in bitterness. They're, they're weeping and, you know, just completely distraught. It's like your whole world is just torn apart as far as who, what you thought he was going to do and all this other stuff and, and just mourning for him. And so you can definitely see how that parallels with, you know, even the Father. You can imagine when Jesus died uh, on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's calling out to his Father. And he, he was made to be sin for us. And when he died on the cross, he was, he was all, had all our sins on him and he went to hell for three days and three nights, suffering the wrath of God. And you know, it talks about he shall make his soul an offering for sin, and we shall see the travail of his soul. He shall be satisfied. And I'm sure that, that you know, that the father would mourn for that. You know, his only begotten son dying on the cross. And so, but all the people that, that knew Jesus, all, you know, the women, the, all his disciples mourning for him. And even when they went to the tomb and saw it was empty, they were still in mourning. They were still in unbelief. And it wasn't until he appeared unto them that they obviously had the joy of seeing that, hey, he actually is alive. He's not dead. And so just a great story with Joseph in the last verse there. It says, And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, the captain, a captain of the guard. So when we get to chapter 39, that's when we're going to get into that story. And uh, I know these are familiar stories. But we can always learn something, and there's always something, especially with that story, as far as just uh, you know dealing with fleeing fornication and all that stuff that we're going to be getting into. Um, but uh, but I wanted to see all those parallels, and so uh, just the allegory of Joseph, and maybe that's some of that stuff you're just like, yeah, I kind of already knew like all those different things. Uh, but hopefully, maybe one of those you're just like, oh, I never really thought about that, dealing with how that pictures Christ. Um, but uh, but Joseph, I. It's one of those things that when I see the story, I see the beginning of Joseph where he's, he's giving the evil report of his brothers, and before honor is humility. And for Joseph to become the leader that he's going to become, and for him to have the wisdom that he's going to have, I believe he had to go through that humility. And so... Uh, that's, what, that's what the story of Joseph, what I see with Joseph and his, char- and his character. His character was molded by the humility he had to have through that. And we see, obviously, that God was with him through all that, but just trusting in the Lord, being humble, being a servant. Just think about 13 years of being a servant and a prisoner before he became the second in power. And Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Jesus was the, the greatest servant of all. And that's what we need to do as Christians is we need to be servants. And if we want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you need to be the, the, the most, the, the biggest servant down here. And so let's, all, let's remember that. But it's just a cool story, obviously, with, with Joseph. So, uh, but let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for everybody that came out. And I pray that you be with those that aren't feeling well. And just pray that you'd heal. Heal us from any illnesses, any diseases, anything like that, Lord. Just pray that you'd uh, protect our family uh, here at Mountain Baptist. And just uh, pray that you'd be with us as we go back to work and, and just help us get everything we need to get done. And Lord, we just pray that everything that we do would bring glory to you. And Lord, we love you and pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.